This video was made with support from my patrons, whose names are on screen now. If you want to, you can join them today and even get access to exclusive content. The link to my Patreon is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, on with the show. The time has finally come. On the 31st of January 2024, the servers for Gran Turismo Sport will be going offline for good. So I only think it's right that before that day comes, we should take a trip down memory lane. GT Sport is a game that I believe will be forgotten, but simultaneously, we will also never forget. This game represented such a drastic shift in what it meant to be a Gran Turismo game and has changed the trajectory of the series in more ways than we can imagine. Let's go back to the beginning. GT Sport was unveiled to the public in October of 2015, and from the start, it was clear that things were going to be different. Not only would it be the series' first foray onto the PlayStation 4, but all of the content from the previous games was scrapped, and everything rebuilt to offer a truly fresh experience. The name alone was a pretty clear statement. This was still Gran Turismo, but clearly separate from the first six games. One of the biggest new things when it came to GT Sport was a partnership with the FIA. This was originally announced back in GT6, but with Sport, there would now be official FIA-sanctioned online championships taking place in the game. And not only that, but it soon became quite clear that a lot of the content within the game, like the cars and tracks, would be strongly influenced by the needs of competitive racing. Most of it was completely brand new to the series, including the long-awaited arrival of Porsche, but with many fan-favourite cars and tracks not making the cut. All of this would culminate in the serious online racing portion of the game known as Sport Mode, and as time went on, other new features would be announced. A full livery editor would finally make its appearance in the franchise, as well as Scapes, essentially an evolution of the photo travel from previous games, but using real-life photos with 3D mapping, which the in-game car models could be placed into. But for many, GT Sport will always be defined by not what it included, but what it lacked, especially at launch. Throughout the pre-release period, Polyphony and Sony had been adamant that whilst it wasn't Gran Turismo 7, Sport would still be far more substantial than the previous prologue games. But when it came to face the facts, only 150 cars included at launch, 17 circuit locations, no dynamic time or weather, and the big one, no proper single-player career mode, it was obvious to many that GT Sport was not what they wanted from a Gran Turismo game on the PS4. I remember being there at the time and seeing the waves of people disappointed by this radical change in direction, stating things like, I'm not gonna buy GT Sport, this is an insult to Gran Turismo fans, and they removed everything that made the older games so good. And you couldn't really blame them, because in some ways, that was true. But at the same time, this new direction did offer new and interesting possibilities. And what's important is that they were always clear about this shift. They never tried to pretend that GT Sport was something that it clearly wasn't. And as we would come to find out with Gran Turismo 7, or Gran Turismo Sport 2 as some like to call it, this sort of thing does matter more to players than some developers and publishers seem to think. Anyway, after a traditional Gran Turismo delay, GT Sport finally released in October 2017. So, what happened? What was the game like? Well, kind of as expected. Of course, the online and sport mode part of the game was very important, but I'll talk more about that later. Whilst the complete campaign mode wasn't included, before release we had been assured many times that there would still be plenty of single-player content to dive into. And was there? Well, not really. Beyond Arcade Mode, the only offline modes that existed in GT Sport were Circuit Experience, a series of time trials at each circuit, Driving School, basically the license center from the previous games, and Mission Challenges. Effectively, what they had done was to take a complete Gran Turismo single player, then remove the actual events and career races, and just give us what's left. 
Circuit experience is fine. It helps with learning the new tracks, but other than that, it's just something to do and another way to earn credits. And whilst the driving school is clearly very similar to the license center, the tests within it are slightly different in terms of how they've been packaged. In those older GT games, did you ever think, man, having to start and stop the car in the first test is pretty intense? No? Well, Polyphony did, because this game has separate tests where you have to launch the car and drive to the finish, and also launch the car and then stop in the designated area. With this extra bloat, it takes eight whole tests before you can even turn a corner. Clearly, they were very concerned that beginners might struggle, but this is still overkill. For the most part, the tests consist of driving a section of track, but there are a few which take the form of races, which teach certain things like fuel saving, as well as the penultimate test which features drifting, for some reason. The final test is the only one that involves completing a full lap time trial. This might be because circuit experience already does those, so there isn't much need to add any more. Also, these tests only came in beginner and intermediate levels, which would imply that they would add some sort of advanced level further down the line. But spoiler alert, they never did. If you were looking for something to do solo in GT Sport at launch, the mission challenges were your best bet. They consisted of eight stages, each containing eight missions, to make a grand total of 64 mission events. These start off fairly slow, with some pretty basic challenges including just normal races, but they start to pick up in the later stages. You'll find time rallies, where you have to pass slower cars and checkpoints to increase your remaining time, unique super special stages in the Northern Isle Festival, and longer self-proclaimed endurance races even featuring some multi-class action. As far as mission events go, they're pretty decent. And if it wasn't already clear that the mission challenges were intended to be the main bulk of the single player modes, completing every challenge unlocks the ending movie as well. So that's pretty much all there was to GT Sport at launch. This streamlined single player, combined with the massively reduced car and track roster, meant that once the novelty of the shiny new graphics and updated handling model wore off, there wasn't much left. People's worst fears when it came to GT Sport not really feeling like a Gran Turismo game seemed to come true. But there was one major difference, a benefit which no other GT game before then had really shown that had the potential to completely change everything. Downloadable content, or DLC, was nothing new to Gran Turismo. Both GT5 and GT6 included them in some form, whether it be through free updates to the game or separately paid items. With GT Sport, series producer Kazunori Yamauchi went on record before release to emphasize how important regular content updates would be to the game. We wouldn't be left waiting for a whole year after launch for them like with GT5 either, they would be coming thick and fast after the game released. He even mentioned the possibility for the game to reach up to 500 cars by the end of its life. So clearly, big things were planned. And true to his word, it only took one month before we got the first new content drop, starting off modestly with three cars. But the size of this update would prove more as the exception rather than the rule, with December's update bringing 12 cars to the game, 10 of which being returning from GT6. January 2018 saw the first new circuit brought to the game with Monza also returning from GT6, as well as 10 more cars. Over time, there would also be new variations added for existing circuits, like Kyoto Driving Park, Lake Maggiore, and Blue Moon Bay. If there's one thing that can't be denied about GT Sport, it's that the frequency and sheer volume of free content they added to the game was truly unmatched. Sure, the fact that the game was so underbaked at launch means that to a degree, this content was necessary, but even still, it was quite impressive. Although, by the end of the game's life, they did fall some way short of the 500 car estimate, the game was clearly in a much different place than when it came out. But what can you do with all of these cars and tracks? 
Of course they could be used for online racing and sport mode, but as the single player was barely even there, what was the point? Well, that December 2017 update added something to rectify this. The lack of single player content in GT Sport was very noticeable, especially when you consider that the legacy of the previous games was built on their rich and expansive careers. So, what they did was add an entire career mode to the game in the form of the GT League. Now, this has to be the single biggest thing they ever added to GT Sport in its over six years of service. From the outside, GT League appears very similar to the main GT modes from the previous games, GT3 in particular. There are four leagues, Beginner, Amateur, Professional, and Endurance, with the events in each subsequent league generally being longer and using faster cars. It did start off fairly modestly, with just a handful of events in each league, certainly a far cry from those older games. But the great thing about it was that as the game expanded with more cars and tracks, so too did GT League. This included not only more races for existing events, but plenty more new events as well, including even some events returning from previous games, which expanded the event variety immensely. GT League is now a huge part of what GT Sport is, so to think that when the game launched it didn't even exist is kind of absurd. For many people who had little to no interest in the online racing, GT League was GT Sport, and was the only thing that kept them playing after they finished everything in the base game. I myself have sunk quite a bit of time into it, as you can see here. But even if it was a great addition to sports that added a ton of gameplay, there were some pretty big shortcomings. Despite being an obvious homage to the past GT games, if the use of music from GT2 didn't already make that clear enough, there were many aspects of it that were missing. I've played GT Sport since the open beta, and was there throughout the numerous updates which added to and changed the game. So, what I thought would be really interesting is to make a completely brand new account and jump into what is GT League in its final, completed form. By doing this, we can really see how the experience differs from the older games. So, the game starts off by giving you a car in the N300 class, a Renault Sport Megane in my case, but also 50,000 credits. Very generous of them. This alone is easily enough to clear the early events, but if you need a hand, then you can head over to the car settings menu. GT Sport didn't have a proper upgrade system, but tuning is still available, so you can freely modify your car's settings, including using the best tyre compound allowed for each event, as every car already has access to every type of tyre. You can still increase the power and lower the weight of cars, but this is now done through a slider. There's a second form of currency in this game called mileage points, earned simply from driving. One of their uses is to expand the range in which you can adjust the levels of power and weight for each car. Even without using mileage points to upgrade this, you can still adjust these slightly, so almost every car can have increased power and lower weight straight out of the box. Like I said, over time they continued adding more races to existing events. This was cool because it gave you a reason to go back into these events and try out different cars if you wanted to. But the side effect of this comes in when you start from scratch, because as you can see here, the Sunday Cup, the first event in the game, has nine races. And here I was thinking the five races in most of GT4's events were excessive. And this isn't an outlier. Many of these events have between seven and nine races each. Now, that might make the game feel like a grind, but that leads us to another key difference. Although prize cars are given out for various things in GT Sport, completing events in the GT League is oddly not one of them. What this means is that there's no incentive to complete full events unless you're aiming for total completion. 
this can lead to a completely different style of gameplay, wherein you can just pick out a couple of races in each event to do before moving on to the next. Since there are no prize cars, and you can't spend money on upgrading your current cars, it's more about completing races to earn money, to then buy the cars you want to, and use those in whichever events they can be used. There's no real strategy or planning involved, especially when you consider how easy it is to earn money from GT League events. So there's nothing to stop you jumping from event to event in each league, but what about jumping from league to league? Traditionally, harder leagues were characterised by having events which require later licences and also needing you to drive a faster car, thus acting as natural roadblocks. With GT Sport, this is not the case. Completing the driving school tests has no bearing on the GT League, and obtaining higher-end cars is not very difficult. But it would be wrong to say that there are no roadblocks, because GT Sport instead does this with your driver level tier. Basically, you earn XP in the game, and every 10 levels, you unlock a new driver tier, like Amethyst, Ruby, Emerald, etc. The thing is though, that earning XP is not exclusive to the GT League, or the single player in general. You can earn it from doing practically anything in this game. From my experience, it doesn't take that long to reach level 30, where you become an Emerald Driver and unlock the Endurance League. So again, it's not much of a roadblock. Also, every event is a single race event. There are no championships where you earn points, and no end goal, like winning the GT World Championship, for example. So, when all of this is added together, the GT League is just an event list. It may look like classic Gran Turismo, but the experience it can offer will never live up to what came before. It really makes you appreciate what those older games did with their structure. How on the surface they seemed similar to a simple event list, but all of the subtle design choices they made resulted in games that can take you in so many interesting directions. In a previous video, I made a very bold claim in that when it comes to a classic Gran Turismo experience, GT Sport can do it better than GT7. Now, I was being slightly facetious when I said that, because obviously GT7 is closer in terms of general structure and features to the older games, just with far less freedom. But that statement is emblematic of a few things. The first is that although GT7 does a lot of what those older games did, like a full car upgrade system, championships, licenses, etc., the way in which it does those things falls completely flat, because they don't flesh them out enough, or use them in interesting ways like the previous games did. It all just feels hollow, as if they understand that people like these things about the older games, but they don't fully understand why. But the second is that although GT League is just an event list, by the time they stopped adding new events to it, it had become a really damn good event list. If you're inclined to, there is so much to do. So many races and incredible variety in the events, wherein pretty much every car in the game has at least one event where it fits in. So, if you really enjoy driving a certain car, there's guaranteed to be something for you. This is in complete contrast to GT7, which even now still lacks many of the staple events you would expect to see, given the types of cars in the game. It's like they're trying to do what GT Sport did, with starting off very basic and then expanding over time. But the difference was that as GT Sport's GT League was expanding, so was the car and track roster. At launch, GT7 had plenty of car and track variety already, but the event variety was just piss poor for seemingly no reason. Also with GT Sport, they generally added more races and events into GT League per update than what we've seen with GT7. It's simple, if you give people things to do in the game, they will do it. But of course, the quality of what you give them to do does matter as well. Unfortunately with GT Sport, the races follow the standard chase the rabbit formula that was really pioneered by GT6. 
You start behind a long line of opponents all strung out. They drive around very slowly as you pass them one by one, until you get into the lead when they suddenly wake up and go into overdrive, making you wonder why they didn't just start them off this quick to begin with, and then make the starting grid much closer so you can have an actual race with them. You know, the usual. The AI are slightly faster than they were in GT6, but still not great. But with that said, if all that matters to you is having a large amount of events where you can drive your favourite cars, and structure and progression aren't that important, then this is great. GT League will always be an interesting footnote in Gran Turismo history. But if there is one thing that I believe it should always be remembered for, it is having the greatest named event in the entire series. What more is there to say? I love Gran Turismo, that should be obvious by now. And of course, the classic Gran Turismo formula that we saw in various versions in the first six games are what I, and so many other people, really enjoy about this franchise. But I have an admission to make. Gran Turismo Sport is, without a doubt, the Gran Turismo game that I have clocked the most hours in. And it's not even close. Forget GT3, GT4, they're nowhere near. GT6 is probably the nearest, where it must have close to 1000 hours total, but GT Sport will most likely stay at the top as my most played game for a while to come. Now, there's a few reasons for this. One is that back when the game was still current, I had a lot of free time and very few responsibilities, so I could just sit and play the game for hours and hours each day. I of course spent a lot of time doing races in GT League, as well as hundreds of hours designing liveries, and I ended up as one of the very few people to be able to say that they have the Platinum Trophy for this game. But this is GT Sport we're talking about, and to rack up that amount of playtime could only mean one thing. I was a Sport Mode Sweat. Yes, I have mentioned this before, but back around 2018, 2019, I was one of the top sport mode players, racing against, and occasionally beating, the fastest guys in the EMEA region. Despite always having a strong attachment for the rich single player gameplay loop, which Gran Turismo became famous for, I was always open minded coming into sports. I'd done some league racing on GT6 and a couple of other games, but prior to 2018, I had never competed in an actual esports competition. So when I realised that I was actually decent, still racing on a regular PS4 controller by the way, I thought that I might as well give it a proper go and see what happens. So much had been sacrificed when it came to GT Sport for the sake of the online racing not just in terms of pure content, but also how the game was structured. Like I said, at launch it was a shell of a Gran Turismo game, so sport mode had to be a success. And was it? Well, that really depends on your definition of success. It was clearly trying to mirror something like iRacing, but for the console market. You had a driver rating, which reflected your overall speed, and a sportsmanship rating, which reflected how likely you were to do things that make you look bad. These could be hit or miss, but for the most part I'd say that they worked as intended. The basic idea was that fast and clean drivers would be paired against other fast and clean drivers, so the incentive was there to drive as well as you could. Of course, this meant that dirty drivers would be matched together as well, which makes sense, but it meant that if you ended up in a race with 19 dirty drivers, it was much harder to drive clean yourself, so things could just snowball from there. I spent the majority of my time in sport racing against some of the best drivers out there, so of course, my outlook on it will be more positive than the majority. Frankly, the racing back then was awesome. I had so many great races, battles, and overtakes, and just watching back the old replays I have saved of some of these races puts a smile on my face. It truly was peak online racing. So I can't fault it from that aspect, but clearly it wasn't perfect. 
things like the penalty system, track limits, and balance of performance were always contentious. To their credit, they kept tweaking these things, but never seemed to find a great balance. And even now in GT7, this still seems to be the case. To be honest, a lot of the biggest issues with sport mode have always been to do with the settings and structure of it. I'm talking about things like when they had insane tyre wear for the FIA races which completely wrecked pad users and made the racing far less fun. Or the repetitive car and track combos for daily races, which used to update every day but was then changed to every week partway through 2018. We still have no idea why they did this. Due to many of these factors and personal reasons, I stopped competing partway through 2019. I never qualified for any of the live events, unfortunately. I was a reserve for the 2018 Salzburg World Tour event, and then missed out on going to the regional finals that year due to an unfair rule that capped the maximum entrance from any single country in the EMEA region to three. This was back when the UK had by far the highest strength of field in the region, meaning that when they were choosing the top 30 drivers, you could easily be in the top 20. But if there were three other drivers from your country ahead of you in the rankings, you wouldn't be chosen. But then some drivers who were barely in the top 50 would be chosen instead, simply because their country had very little competition. It was stupid and unfair, but that's life I suppose. At the time, I was pretty sore about this, but in hindsight, I realise now that it never really mattered. When the FIA Championship started back in 2018, the sky truly was the limit. I mean, this was the biggest racing game franchise hosting online championships that were officially sanctioned by the FIA, the governing body that oversees the biggest real-world racing championships, like the WEC, WRC, and even Formula One. Combine this with the insane rise of esports generally, including the massively inflated prize pools, and surely winning these championships would be a life-changing event. Well, it turns out we were just a bunch of daydreaming chumps, because the reality couldn't be much further from that. Now, it has to be said that these events are extremely well produced. Clearly, a lot of money has been put into making them look and run as best as they possibly can. And also, the competitors are treated very well, with all of their travel and accommodation expenses paid for, and they certainly don't skimp out on those. But beyond that, things go downhill very quickly. None of the competitors are paid to be there, regardless of their results. Beyond some merch like racing wheels and watches back when Tagoya was a partner, there is nothing to gain. Not only does this mean that the stakes are massively reduced, but it also means that from a competitor's point of view, it's just a massive waste of time. To be at the level of these drivers, you have to practice for hundreds of hours, and also you can win basically just a free holiday. The alternative is that you could just get a part-time job instead, and the end result would almost be the same. But not only can competitors not earn money directly from the organisers, there's nothing to earn from sponsorship either. At these events, there's a strict dress code, so there's no way to represent your esports team or any personal sponsors. This has seen some major sim racing teams and organisations have little to no investment in the series because there is nothing to gain from it. And this lack of interest trickles down to all levels. Many competitors from past seasons have hung up their gloves because at this point, why bother? Nothing is going to change, so where does the motivation come from? When I look back to the guys from the UK who I competed against directly in 2018-2019, pretty much all of them have left the scene. It's almost comical how what was the strongest country in the EMEA region when it came to the sheer number of people competing at a high level has crumbled away because all of the top players simply don't give a shit anymore. And if the top drivers don't care, then why should the viewers? It is very noticeable how much less interest there is in these championships compared to when they started in 2018. Even during Covid, when sim racing had a massive surge in popularity, the slide still continued. It is quite sad because the potential was there to do something incredible, 
As I say, the live events themselves are excellent, probably the best in all of sim racing. But what's clear now is that all of this is really just a marketing tool for Sony. Nobody really gets anything out of it, it's just a money pit. There's no chance in hell you can turn this into a career, or use it as a springboard into real life racing like with GT Academy which came before. Unless your name is Igor Fraga, in which case you're the golden child. Honestly, the fact that the Gran Turismo movie was centred around GT Academy, but used GT7 as the current game in the film, is kind of embarrassing when you think about the full picture and where we are today. Anyway, I didn't intend this to be an expose on the online championships, but if you want to know more, then Jalopnik did a great article on the situation back in July 2022, which I'll link in the description. So what's become clear is that despite Polyphony's best efforts, there just isn't as much interest in sport mode as there is in the traditional single player. This point is now extremely obvious given the discussions around GT7 and what players consider as priorities. The choice to build GT Sport almost entirely around the competitive online racing scene was a bold one, but I can now say with 100% confidence that it was not a good decision. Think about it like this, a good single player experience can be fully enjoyed by almost anyone. But a good, competitive online racing experience can only be fully enjoyed by a select few. What had to be sacrificed to make this a reality was simply not worth the benefits it offered. Like I said, I have some great memories with sport mode, but to now see the end goal of it, or should I say lack thereof, makes the loss of a massive part of what makes Gran Turismo Gran Turismo feel pretty meaningless. The fact that GT Sport, this underbaked game which came out four years into the console's life cycle and by the end of it still felt very far away from a fully fleshed out game, was the only Gran Turismo title exclusive to the PS4 is just ridiculous. They really should have known better. And all of this has got me thinking, what could GT Sport have really been? Would it have been possible for them to deliver a complete game at launch that not only contains a full single player Gran Turismo experience, but still supports the sport mode and serious online racing angle, as well as doing all of that with the incredible visuals and other technical improvements? Personally, I think that yes, this was all possible. Now, let me show you how. Gran Turismo Sport releasing in the compromised state that it was can all be traced back to the development of Gran Turismo 5. Starting soon after the release of Gran Turismo 4, to say the development of GT5 was compromised would be an understatement. There are a few key reasons why this happened, one being Polyphony taking on too many other projects at the same time. Between 2006 and 2009, there was Tourist Trophy, and Gran Turismo HD, which would never be made beyond the demo version GTHD concept. There was also Gran Turismo 5 Prologue, and Gran Turismo for Boys, which was again never finished. Although there was also Gran Turismo for the PSP, which Kaz would later state was a rendition of the Gran Turismo for Boys idea. Then of course we have to mention the architecture of the PlayStation 3. From how many developers at the time described it, making games for the PS3 was like trying to get blood out of a stone. It was a real challenge, and GT5 was a very well known casualty of these issues. Despite all of this, it was eventually finished and released in November of 2010. But there were problems. Despite being in development for 5 plus years, the game only featured around 200 newly modelled cars, with the remaining 800 plus being ported over almost unchanged from GT4. Then there were the performance issues. The game suffered from dropped frames, screen tearing, flickering shadows, and various other graphical oddities. Not to mention the unbearably long loading times. 
there were many parts of the game which just felt simply unfinished, and you can only assume this was another result of GT5's development hell. There were other issues, but these ones were the most obvious from the outside. But as it took them so long to make GT5, just three years later, the all-new PlayStation 4 was released. At almost the same time, Gran Turismo 6 was announced and then released in December 2013. But here's the thing, it was on the already outdated PS3. This was a very odd decision. You would think that given GT5 took so long and came out so late in the PS3's life, they would want to get a head start on the PS4, but seemingly not. Maybe this was due to GT5 costing a rumoured $80 million to develop. You see, in interviews before GT5 came out, Kaz was already implying that the next game would be built as an evolution of GT5, rather than starting from scratch again. It's not unreasonable to assume that Polyphony and Sony wanted to get their money's worth, and so a second game on the PS3 was given the green light. Not to mention that it would reward their development struggles even more. GT6 would receive updates over the next few years, until GT Sport was announced in 2015, released in 2017, and then GT6 went offline in 2018. So, that seems to be the full explanation of why GT Sport came out so late into the PS4's life cycle, and also why it lacked content, given that Polyphony was still updating GT6 during the first half of GT Sport's development. But that still doesn't fully stack up. So, GT Sport was created over four years, maybe even longer, yet only released with 150 cars total. Sure, the game represented a noticeable leap in quality over GT6 in all areas, but this still seems like an excessive development time for what was actually made. So, it's my belief that GT Sport could have launched with far more content than it actually did. Regular content updates were a key part of the strategy for GT Sport, but doing this meant that content had to be held back. Given that the game started receiving regular updates almost immediately, a lot of this content would have been made before the game released, and then added at a much later date. This means that they could have chosen to include more in the game from launch, at the behest of having updates that were less frequent and had less content. In just the first four months after GT Sport released, they added 37 cars, updated three existing circuits with new variations, and added one whole circuit in the form of Monza. To me, it's clear that a lot of this stuff was already ready to go from before the game came out, and given the development timeline, that seems to make perfect sense. Then we need to consider reused content. In my video covering the standard cars in GT5 and GT6, I mentioned that there is a theory that many of the premium PS3 era models were actually carried over onto the PS4. This theory gains weight when you compare the models side by side. As you can see, they are very similar. But even if this isn't exactly true, that makes you beg the question of, why not? By the time of GT6, the models were being created to a very high standard, and considering that they were starting development on GT Sport at around the same time, it frankly doesn't make sense for them to not future-proof these cars so they could be used again in the PS4 era. If we consider just the premium models that were new to GT6, both from launch and added in updates, that's already around 200 plus car models that could have been ported over to GT Sport with minimal effort. They could have then used the rest of their time modelling new cars from scratch, like the ones we saw in GT Sport from launch, mostly newer models and their racing versions. This way, far more cars could have been included from launch, representing a much wider variety. The same ideas apply to the tracks as well. One of the biggest blunders with GT Sport, in my opinion, was not including any of the classic original circuits from the past games. Kaz himself said that there was no particular reason for it, which is an extremely Kaz thing to say. It was obvious that many would be unhappy with this decision, but again, I think it could have been avoided entirely. 
The final track that was added to GT6 in an update was Midfield Raceway in 2015, completely revamped from its last appearance in GT4. The track looked gorgeous, and I personally would have no qualms about seeing it in a PS4 game. The same would be true of Apricot Hill, which also returned in GT6. Again, these two could have easily been carried over to GT Sport with minimal effort, as well as many other tracks new to GT6. I do also feel like it would have been worth it to sacrifice at least a couple of the brand new original tracks in GT Sport to instead remodel some of the classics. In that interview from December 2017, Kaz name-dropped Deep Forest as one circuit they were already working on. But for whatever reason, it took them another four plus years to reintroduce it into GT7. I feel like it really would have been worth it to make sure it was ready for GT Sport at launch, along with one other, maybe Grand Valley Speedway. And obviously they shouldn't mess with them too much, like they did when they came back in GT7. Would it really be such a crime to have sport mode races at the original Deep Forest? So if you consider all of my points here, I believe that GT Sport could have launched with close to 400 cars and 25 plus circuit locations. Compare that to the 150 cars and 17 circuit locations that it did launch with. The only sacrifices that would need to be made is that the post-launch support would be noticeably weaker and there would be a slight reduction in overall quality given the reuse of GT6 assets. But all of this I believe would be very much worth it because of what they could now do with the game. So the car list is far more fleshed out, still containing a lot of the newer road cars and Group 3, Group 4 racing versions which we would see in the final game but also now plenty of the older models and other types of cars that don't necessarily fit into the whole sport mode aspect, but that we're so used to seeing in these games. The same would be true of the track list, where we would still have a good selection of new original circuits, but possibly a few more real world circuits, and a decent selection of returning original circuits as well. And all of this would allow us to include a proper single player career mode from launch. One of the weird things that GT Sport does is having this sort of pseudo progression outside of the GT League. At launch, the game still had credits and Brand Central where you could go to buy cars. It also had some semblance of progression when it came to the prize cars in the driving school and mission challenges, as they get better the further you progress. But credits in this game are generally quite easy to earn. It won't take very long at all before you can afford the high-end cars. And even if you don't buy them yourself, you'll probably just win them from the daily roulette. All you need to do is complete your driving marathon each day and you can win a car at random, chosen from almost any car in the entire game. This completely destroys any sense of progression they may have been going for, as was proven on my new account, where my first ever roulette gave me a Lamborghini Diablo GT. It's very strange, it's like the game can't decide whether it wants to be like the older games, where you have to work to earn money and build your car collection, or like any other racing sim, where you have access to everything from the start. They were clearly concerned about making it too difficult to earn cars, given that players would need these cars to race in sport mode as well. So what I believe they should have done is simple, have two separate garages one for sport mode and one for the single player. The sport mode garage would automatically have pretty much every car you would need for that mode, like the grouped race cars, and the single player garage would function like the garages from the previous games, wherein you would start off with nothing but have to work through the single player events slowly building up your collection. This means that we could then expand the GT League to be what it always should have been, with a much more structured progression featuring prize cars, championships, and upgrades. A proper upgrade system was always a curious omission to me. Sure, it wasn't necessary for sport mode, hence why they didn't include it and went with these sliders instead, but I think it wouldn't have taken much effort to include at least a few basic upgrades, and yet it would have added a lot to the gameplay. One practical benefit that would have given for sport mode is when it comes to balance of performance. Alongside the racing groups, there was also Group N, 
where road cars would be balanced around their rough power output. It was a terrible idea, to put it lightly. The fact that you could have classic muscle cars going up against modern sports cars, hatchbacks, and pickup trucks within a given group should have set off at least some red flags. But the fact that the muscle cars were then stuck on their terrible drum brakes, which couldn't be upgraded, made the whole thing even more farcical. How did they think this would ever work? So yes, an upgrade system would have been useful for both single player and sport mode. When it comes to the overall single player experience, I'm imagining something like GT3. GT3 is the game that always comes to mind when I think of making the most out of what little content you have. My reworked version of GT Sport would have a decent amount of content, but not amazing by those standards. So it would be very important to structure the events around each type of car and track that's included. In this sense, nothing goes to waste, just like GT3. We could also include some new event types and game modes like we see in the mission challenges. Overall, it would be an experience that is deep, but also of consistent quality. This was the best thing about GT3, and I think GT Sport could have leveraged the same advantage. The increased quality was certainly the best thing about Sport compared to GT5 and 6, which were much more cobbled together. But using that quality to actually make a fleshed out experience is far more important than the game simply being high quality, but with no real substance. So that's what I would have done to make GT Sport into a much more complete Gran Turismo game from launch, while still including sport mode and maintaining a high level of quality in all aspects. Naturally, this doesn't solve all of the issues with sport. By nature, it would have always been somewhat compromised no matter what they did with it. But with these changes, I do feel like they could have named it Gran Turismo 7 without it feeling like an insult or even GT7 Sports, which was the original plan. So, after everything, will people remember GT Sport? Well, I guess the question really is, is GT Sport worth remembering? If we look from a factual standpoint, there are quite a few things which GT Sport brought to the franchise, and a couple of those things are actually exclusive to GT Sport. Of course, the DNA of Sport will live on in GT7, given that it's built on top of the foundation left by Sport, but does this game have a personality of its own? This is a question that many of us had about GT5 when GT6 came out, and I suppose you could say the same thing about GT1 and GT2. But with time, we're now able to appreciate where those games differ. GT6 has all of the content of GT5, and then some more, but there are plenty of structural differences, both big and small, that lead to these two games giving vastly different experiences. For GT Sport, it's a bit different, because it was never trying to do what the rest of the games in the series have. In some ways, GT Sport is sport mode. It is the reason why it exists. But it's been on life support for the past two years since GT7 came out, and now it's finally going for good. But GT Sport without sport mode is like a car without an engine or chassis. It defeats the point. That said, we can at least be thankful that the offline portion of GT Sport will be preserved, given that normally the game requires an online connection to save progress. But sadly, all of our custom liveries will be gone unless you transfer them over to GT7. I think the overall presentation of Sport is really unique in the series. One thing I appreciate coming back from GT7 is how original it feels. I know there are some people who really like the whole vibe and sounds of the menus, and there are a few songs here that I enjoy too. Although for the most part, I'm not the biggest fan. The ambient music just doesn't feel right, like when you load into a race and are greeted by a smooth, relaxing piece. What am I supposed to be feeling right now? I just don't get it, and I probably never will. But on the topic of music, let's mention the In Race soundtrack. Again, like the menu music, I got bored of GT7 soundtrack very quickly, simply because it reuses so much music from GT5 Prologue onwards. It just feels lazy and like nobody really cared. 
However, it was GT Sports that started the trend of reusing a lot of music from previous games, but thankfully nowhere near as much as GT7. And I have to say that the new licensed music they got for GT Sport is really damn good. I actually forgot just how hard this soundtrack goes. Here's a few of my favourites. Now that's some good stuff. GT7, take notes. Now, if there is one thing that I believe will add to the legacy of GT Sport over time, it's how it represented this clean break between the first six games and what comes next. GT Sport was in some ways like a reboot of the franchise. It was deliberately experimental and didn't care for tradition. In some ways, I can respect that, but the issue then comes when you consider why those traditions existed. The Gran Turismo CarPG formula offers a lot when it comes to gameplay, which GT Sport simply could never match. Because even if they added more cars, more tracks, and more things to do, as the game has been structured to prioritise another game mode, it was never going to take full advantage of these things. And of course, Sport Mode on its own could never hope to match what those previous games did. This is the main issue. If you're doing something new, how do you implement it? Do you add it onto the existing experience, or use it to replace the existing experience? Common Wisdom would suggest that the former is the best option, but with GT Sport, they chose the latter. And we've seen this continue in GT7, wherein instead of the cafe menu books adding an interesting new dimension to the main career, it is the main career. And in both cases, these are major issues, because it's obvious that what is being replaced simply cannot be matched by its replacement in terms of overall value to the players. It's like trying to replace a tuna with a goldfish. It's not gonna work. And whatever gimmick they come up with for Gran Turismo 8, I can almost predict that the story will be the same. Another thing that GT Sport has to be held accountable for is when it comes to content updates. Now, originally, this was seen as a great thing, as the lack of consistent updates to GT5 and 6 was always a source of frustration. And in GT Sport, as I've said, their consistency with this was impressive. But when you consider how this choice to deliver the game in such an unfinished state, and then add much more content over time, affected it in the long run, you do have to ask if this was actually worth it. As I've explained, I believe that they could have given us a complete game with a decent amount of content if they wanted to, but they just chose not to. This wasn't so bad when it came to GT Sport, because the updates were very good and always brought interest back to the game. But now with GT7, we can see how this approach falls down. GT7 had plenty of content when it launched, but how they used this content was abysmally poor. There was such a lack of race events and things to do in general. Very obvious types of cars had no races to use them in, and made you wonder why they were even put into the game. But with time, we can now see why they did this. They're still stuck in the GT Sport mentality. The idea that they can put out a clearly unfinished game, and then keep people interested over time by constantly adding more. Of course, GT Sport wasn't the first to use this tactic, but it's probably the type of game where it works the best. The crucial difference between GT Sport and GT7 was how they were advertised. As I said, GT Sport was always described as this experimental take on a GT game. It was very obvious that it was trying to do something different. The issue is that, although you could apply that same idea to GT7, that game was clearly marketed to fans of the older GT games, the ones with long and complete single-player experiences. And not just because of the nostalgia bait in the trailers, but all of the wording they used as well. So, although it's no worse than GT Sport in many areas, and even far better in some, this approach is simply unacceptable in a way that it wasn't with GT Sport. Because it's not just about the game not being complete at launch. I've always held the sentiments that even if an incomplete game is eventually 
finished, it will still never be as good as a game that came finished when it released. This does depend on the game, because by unfinished, we can mean a game that is fully featured, but suffers from many issues, like bugs and glitches, which mean that certain things don't work as intended, or a game which is more polished, but simply lacking in content in many areas. With GT Sport and GT7, we're talking more about the latter. It's all about setting a solid foundation to build the game from. But with GT Sport and GT7, they didn't finish the foundation before releasing the game, so anything they later add on top of that can never be fully realised or used to its full potential. This is why I personally believe that even if they added every car, every track and every race event that we could possibly ever want to GT7, it will still never feel like a finished game and the experience it can offer will never live up to the games which came as a complete experience straight out of the box. It will always be compromised. And when it comes to the legacy of GT Sport, this will always be my lasting impression. The game that made Polyphony realise that they don't have to deliver a finished product, even if it were a finished product that's flawed in many ways. As long as you can convince people that what they actually want is something entirely different, that offers far less in terms of gameplay and caters to a far more niche audience, then why bother? When the servers go offline later this month, Gran Turismo Sport as a game, despite being the longest supported GT title, surpassing even GT4, is doomed to be forgotten. But Gran Turismo Sport as an influence will surely live on as a part of this franchise for years to come. For better, and certainly for worse.